Today we have uh, Jim Cowie from uh, Renesis. Uh, for, um, for years, actually, um, uh, one of my problems, uh, my personal problems in my life, is that I constantly got asked by people in the press and otherwise, is the internet down in Egypt, Russia, China, wherever? And I would say, and all of us would say, I don't know. <laughs> we can ask the six people that we know whether it's down, and maybe they'll tell us where they won't, and maybe it's their DSL problem or not. Um, and this was sort of a fundamental problem that was that was that seems simple, but it actually can be uh, very hard to answer. Uh, and this has become increasingly important the past couple years, where large-scale outages of the internet have been used as modes of internet control, particularly in the Arab Spring, but in uh, other places as well. Um, so now, uh, thanks to Jim Cow, I, I usually have an answer for that. <laughs> and the answer is go uh, go look at Renesis's blog because they probably, on the same day you asked the question, answered it with actual data from uh, traffic and from routing <coughs> um, what parts of the internet in any, any given country are up or down in any given country. So uh, Jim uh, uh, kindly agreed to come talk to us today. Uh, to some degree about um, those specific issues of tracking um, internet outages, but also more largely about um, the structure of, um, of autonomous systems and uh, uh, networks and provisioning of networks on the internet in a whole, and how that impacts questions of uh, technical, but also political, social, and economic uh, control. Of the internet. So with that, I'm going to over to you. Very good. <coughs> Thanks, Hal. Um, so yeah, it's true. We, we, we do attempt to tell people when the internet is substantially down in particular places. We hope to get it on the same day. Um, uh, we've discovered a whole new sort of data source for this, which is that when the internet goes out in a particular country, reporters will start to call. And so if we say, wow, we got calls from the Associated Press and Bloomberg, and they're all asking about Afghanistan, then we know, oh, you know, time to check the logs. Uh, but uh, so t today, uh, I'm going to be talking, uh, with your permission, about stuff that is down in the, in the basement, in the, buried in the streets of the internet, as opposed to where a lot of you are studying, as I understand it, which is control issues and uh, political issues and application issues up top. Now, that's not to say there aren't control and political issues down below, um, but where we function mostly is, is under, under street level. Um, we're studying how the internet is put together at the most fundamental level, which is agreements among providers and the uh, fibers and the physical resources that the internet runs on. Um, we've been at this, I'm a co-founder, we've been at this for about 10 years now, which seems like a long time. Um, studying the engineering, obviously, uh, the performance, but also the economics and the security, when we can, of the internet. Um, the way we've always done this, historically, is we've collect, connected to hundreds of internet service providers around the world and gotten them to share routing data with us. That is, they're literally giving us copies in real time of all of their routing traffic so that we understand how they reach everything on Earth all the time. And then we mine that. Uh, in recent years, and, and but if anybody has questions, just jump in and, and ask, because there's no reason for this to be unidirectional. Um, we then we augment that by taking a look at the structure of the relationships that are exposed in the pads, for example, uh, if I need to get to a particular site in China, I know all of the providers that serve that site. I know all of the people that they buy from. I know most of the people that they peer with. I can tra trace that back to any place on Earth and figure out what the path should have been if I tried to get from a server in Dayton, Ohio, to a server in Beijing. Um, we're inferring continuously the business relationships, the economics of connectivity from that data, trying to figure out uh, who is peering with each other uh, whether it's settlement free or somebody is paying, and when it's simply a transit relationship, somebody is paying to carry traffic away. And as you can imagine, that evolves daily. Um, we, uh, we try to track uh, the primary providers in every country, we try to track everybody's customer list, and we keep all of this data around forever so we can go back and do cool retrospectives and show how the internet uh, diversity, for example, in, a, in an e internet ecosystem like, uh, like Saudi Arabia or uh, or Canada has changed over time. Um, we find that this, this is the sort of thing that a lot of people need to know about. Network service providers, obviously, for business. Uh, financial services industry wants to know the, the fastest way to get trades executed around the planet. 
Uh, governments are always interested. Any global enterprise these days that does business on multiple continents uh, gets irked when the internet stops working and they have to dive down into the infrastructure to figure out why that is. So um, I brought you a topic on geopolitics just because domestic politics is interesting but international politics to me is, 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 uh, is perhaps you know, more so. Uh, and then I, I had to stop. Um, you know, geopolitics is supposed to have been killed by globalization, right? And globalization is, the, the internet is, geo, is uh, globalization's primary symbol. So the internet actually told me that the internet had killed geopolitics. Um, it, so magically, the internet is, is said to do all of these great things that, you know, it creates civil society where there was none. It has completely, you know, torn down our understanding of how states should function. You know, we're all just inter individuals on Facebook now. Um, Obviously, this is, you know, I, it's not even a complete list of all the great things that the internet magically does. So obviously, this is, a, you know, kind of bunk. The infrastructure is no more flat than the rest of the world. It's, it's really ugly. Um, it was built out of lawyers and people trying to make money, connecting to each other, trying to squeeze money out of people in order to use their resources. So you have tens of thousands of contracts written between consenting parties, big and small, all over the place. Sometimes they're in different places, they speak different languages, they have different culture. Uh, they're all trying to maximize profit. They're all trying to squeak around under the gaze of the regulators. Uh, the internet, by definition, crosses borders, and so everything eventually gets messy. And so everything that you see in, in geopolitics, everything you read about in the paper, about uh, uh, spheres of influence and national interests and so forth, has a counterpart in, in, on the internet, in how internet structure plays out, and in terms of how disputes happen in our and are resolved. And uh, on the internet, most often disputes are resolved by going around the dispute. So what I'll do today, just as a conversation starter, uh, and we'll do this very quickly, so we have lots of time for conversation, is take you on a very brief internet tour of kind of the, the ancient world from Tangier to Bishkek. This is the part of the internet that we call the interesting part of the internet. Not that, that North American internet isn't interesting, not that European internet isn't interesting, but they frankly are kind of boring. Everything kind of costs roughly the same. Everything's really cheap. You can get connectivity anywhere you want. You have six different providers to choose from, unless you're a home broadband user in New Hampshire, say. But <laughs> that aside, if you're a commercial user, generally you have pretty good, pretty good selection. Um, in this world, you don't. You almost always don't. Um, it's dominated by the old incumbents, the old telephone companies. They're often quite friendly with the governments that regulate them and, in some cases, own them. Um, and uh, there's just a lot going on here. You're going to see, as we go through the, the, uh, uh, through the tour, you'll see things that are, are familiar to you from the newspaper, <coughs> grudges, political relations, um, spheres of influence that are developing, a lot of references to things like energy pipelines and energy transport and highways, because that's where you put fiber, and that's what the internet at its core is actually built on. So I always have to stop before I take my tour and, and acknowledge my, my patron saint of uh, large networks in the Eastern Hemisphere. So if you haven't looked up uh, the travels of Ibn Battuta, he wrote a book in the 14th century about his incredible, uh, somewhat fictitious, but probably mostly real travels. Uh, he started as a lawyer in Tangier. He went all the way to China, and he made it all the way back home again, right in the middle of the Black Death. And what he describes is familiar today as you look at modern internet. He's talking about how information flowed along the 14th century networks of scholarship and uh, religious education and commerce along the Silk Road and communication. So uh, this has all been done before. Um, so we'll just blow through these very quickly so you can see how different places experience different things as they try to get connected to the internet. Uh, here we are in the, in the far west. In the Maghreb, you've got Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya, all served by these relatively short submarine cable runs, mostly directly from Europe. These things are coming from, from places like Marseille uh, or Sicily. And these are, this is a best case. This, is, this should be as good as it gets. Um, on the other end of these cables, you get access to everybody who's serving Europe. You get uh, very low latencies, very low delays to, to almost all the content you could ever want in Europe. Um, the only sh uh, thing that, that perhaps throws a fly in the ointment here is that these are mostly run, as I said, by national incumbents. Uh, 
uh, Tunisia has more diversity, uh, Morocco and Algeria, and certainly Libya, relatively less diversity. Um, but still, it's made up for to some extent by the fact that they have so much choice available at the cable landing. Um, and so their, their, their prices are relatively low. Uh, the amount of freedom they have to choose how they're going to transport internet traffic is fairly high. Only to Europe. <laughs> From Morocco to Libya, your, your, your packets are probably going through Spain and Italy. Very, very possibly, yes. Although they are, I mean, these are successive stages in some sense on the same cables. And so uh, it, it's possible that, that on the same cable you can uh, get connectivity from one place to the other. But at a logical level, it's more likely that, yes, the service provider you buy from is probably going to route your traffic back uh, someplace in Europe. Um, it's also true, as we'll see later, that just because you have two different people in one of these countries doesn't mean they can actually send each other traffic. If one of them is a customer of the big incumbent, somebody else is a customer of his small competitor, they may not actually be connected in the country. And their packets may actually go back to Frankfurt or someplace or Paris and, and return to the country. And you can imagine what kind of, of competitive pressure that places. Uh, not very much. If, you, if we move down the coast a little bit, um, Egypt, of course, was in the news this year uh, for internet structure and not in a good way. Egypt has everything it takes to be uh, an internet transit hub for this entire region. It really has huge amounts going for it. It's the natural traversal point for almost all of the fiber optics that are going from the Mediterranean uh, through to the Indian Ocean and beyond. Um, almost all of this is coming ashore at Alexandria, uh, maybe doing an overland traversal, plunking into the Suez, and off it goes. And so this is the physical pinch point for, until now, the majority of transit to the entire Middle East and, and uh, uh, certainly now large parts of Eastern Africa. Um, the problem here has been, um, although there was a, 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 an effort by the regulators to liberalize this, um, Telecom Egypt retained a very central role in terms of maintaining the physical infrastructure. Um, and it was actually possible uh, during the troubles to, to turn off all the internet service providers, bar one or two, um, just by cutting power at a single facility. So you have logical diversity in the sense that there are a lot of service providers serving Egypt, but uh, in terms of, of, the, of uh, how regulation and the physical infrastructure channels that traffic, it turned out that there was a lot less diversity than we thought. I was shocked when I saw that, that um, most of Egypt was taken off. Um, but there it is, a different solution to the problem. If we slide around into the Eastern Med, very quickly, um, Israel has its own cables that come in that are not the same cables used by everybody else in the region. So sometimes you'll hear um, uh, you know, strange complaints like, you know, uh, uh, we had a, a physical cable fault on Simi, we three or four, and lots of countries around the Gulf were thrown out for weeks. And why didn't Israel go down? Well, it's because Israel has their own cables. They have landings on cables that are physically diverse from those that serve other countries. Um, the Palestinian territories are locked in, and so by law, I think, they have to buy through Israeli physical infrastructure. But logically, we now see them buying a lot more in the last year from uh, European carriers like Level 3 or Deutsche Telekom. Um, Jordan is well, well set up because they have submarine cable landings of their own at Aqaba. So they have at least two uh, uh, connections to the big flag cable that goes around the world. Um, uh, they also have terrestrial connectivity to Saudi and, uh, and, 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 and uh, to Turkey, to the <coughs> north, through Syria. Okay? So this is, again, not too bad. There's, there's, there's reasonable connectivity here for those who want it. And so prices for bandwidth are, are higher than they are back in the Maghreb, but they're still modest. If we work our way up the coast, it gets to be worse. Okay? And you can see here the effects of geography and politics. Um, uh, reducing the choices that consumers have in country, reducing the choices that enterprises have if they want to get to the internet. Lebanon was in a terrible position because uh, they didn't have access to the big cables that landed just down the coast in Egypt. All they had was uh, some old-fashioned, uh, uh, relatively small connectivity coming from Cyprus. And then you could see that that was the case because a lot of the autonomous systems in the in Lebanese internet are just are buying connectivity from uh, satellite providers. So they're buying from Satgate. They're buying from providers where the next hop, if you trace into Lebanon, uh, is in Germany somewhere uh, or, or in Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic. Um, 
This all changed in 2010, about a year ago. Uh, they finally got the big IMEWE cable, and suddenly they had a terabit allotted to them of capacity. That's an incredible uh, uh, flood of potential internet landing at their doorstep. Uh, but there were ongoing political problems between the people who had the cable landing and the government, uh, questions about how it was going to be tariffed. I mean, if you allow this flood of internet into your country, the price structure is going to collapse, which it is going to. Uh, it took a, almost a full year just to get hypothetical tariffs published for how much it would cost to get one of these big pipe connections that they had never had access to before. Um, and I think even just now, uh, we've seen providers in Lebanon begin to take advantage of this wonderful new cable landing. And as sure as the sun rises, uh, we've started to see their satellite connections turn off. Because nobody wants to keep an Intel sat satellite internet Earth station working for one day longer than you have to, because it's horrendously expensive. Um, this is exactly the same sort of shift that we've seen in East Africa with the arrival of the SECOM cable. Um, Syria is, if, any, if it's possible, in an even a worse situation. They had the same sort of uh, uh, small pipe connectivity to Cyprus and Lebanon. Uh, and uh, I'll show in a minute how Syria is turning to terrestrial routes to make up for the fact that they can't get adequate submarine connectivity. Um, you can't talk about these guys without going a little farther north and talking about Turkey. So Turkey, uh, as you know, is, is positioned to become a really influential country in the region um, uh, politically and, and sort of as a, uh, as a trendsetter, if you will. And in the internet, it's extremely true. Uh, Turkey has the bridge to Europe, the physical bridge. Um, they are on all of the major fiber paths to Europe, which follow the old Roman roads through Bulgaria. Uh, they have connectivity through Greece, um, who gets it from Italy. And all of this, these, uh, this high bandwidth fiber from Europe sort of flows down the old roads and into Istanbul and on. And Turkey has realized that they are actually a, uh, potentially a major exporter of internet. This, is, this could be a new industry for them. And so not only Turk Telecom, the incumbent, but also their competitors, uh, have started building parallel projects to build fiber to all of their neighbors. So imagine what happens in a world where um, before there was no connectivity, and now uh, uh, perhaps along the lines of some of the old railroads that were built by the Germans you know, before World War I, um, there's now Turkish fiber going down into the Hejaz to serve the Saudi uh, Peninsula, or headed across into Iraq, or even headed to Georgia. So Turkey begins to establish a sphere of influence where they export internet service to a lot of neighbors that they would like to be good friends with. Are these pipelines right away connected? In many cases, they are, because the engineering's already done. This is really rugged territory in eastern Turkey. Um, if you've, you know, once you've got a pipeline sighted, um, usually they have fiber buried alongside them anyway, because they want to have uh, uh, control and communications between the various stations along the route. So in some sense, you almost get internet for free as the pipelines go through, which is this, this connection that recurs about the uh, uh, energy transport being very much linked to information transport in this region. Are Greeks and Turks friends when it comes to the internet? Um, <laughs> OTE is a huge Greek company that owns two, the two big fiber networks coming down redundantly, one up Italy, one through Hungary. And uh, in that sense, yes, they are, because they offer Turk Telecom enormous amounts of bandwidth. Um, commercial relationships are the best friendship, right? Um, so where does all that bandwidth go ultimately? Well, the Gulf states have been looking for alternatives for a long time. Um, the Gulf states uh, all around the Saudi, the Arabian Peninsula, have been unhappy with uh, the availability of submarine links, they always get cut. People drag anchors across them. You lose your internet for weeks. It's just untenable. Um, so these guys have started looking for alternatives. And Egypt really brought it into focus for them. Virtually overnight, they were talking about, how do we get around the Egyptian pinch point? These people could deny us internet with a single accidental or deliberate break. So um, suddenly, overnight, consortiums spring up to build overland paths that can be redundant with these submarine paths. Um, uh, perhaps a topic for, for questions or another day. We've worked closely with the telecoms regulator in Bahrain, uh, which is a place where um, things were extremely expensive. They continue to be very expensive, but um, this is sort of evidence that pushing for open competition and inviting creative alternatives for second and third uh, uh, providers 
uh, can really lower prices for, for consumers and businesses. And uh, I think what everybody here has on their mind, perhaps Bahrain most of all, is um, when the energy economy turns here, there has to be something to follow. What follows is the information economy, perhaps. This is where your college graduates can go. They have to get IT jobs. You need the internet for that. It has to be fast, and it has to be reliable, and it has to be cheap. And so this has become a major strategic question for all of these countries. How do we get the internet cheaper, faster, more secure, um, without going through people we don't like? Uh, on that note, uh, these are some of the, the ways people have not only hypothesized about getting internet into the Gulf, but actually started to build these. Um, in red there, you see the Jadi link, which is a uh, consortium-based path. It's actually lit now. It's working and passing traffic. Um, Saudi Telecom, uh, Jordanian Telecom, uh, Syrian Telecom, and Turk Telecom got together and built this route from Jeddah to Amman to Damascus to Istanbul. Uh, it's still up through all of the troubles in Syria. Um, if anything, the Syrian government has been very um, helpful and, and willing to demonstrate that this is business as usual. These pads are uh, uh, maintained, and the service is lit. Uh, you have the competitors in each of these countries, the competitors to the incumbents, uh, building a parallel route, the RCN route, which goes from the submarine cable landing at Fujaira, I should have a laser pointer, to Riyadh, to Amman, to Tartus, to Istanbul, slightly different routes, different companies in, in, in each country, uh, except for um, in Amman and in Syria. RCN, is that the same local company? You know, no, it's a, it's, oh, okay. no well, that would be cool, wouldn't it? Uh, no, that's an acronym collision. Um, one of the really interesting ones here is EPEG. That's the, the brown line up top is EPEG. That's the European Persian Express Gateway, which has not been built, but is really cool. It starts in Oman, where Omantel is talking about building uh, an entire internet exchange in Telehouse. It jumps across uh, the Strait of Hormuz just before the Strait to Jask in Iran. It runs on Iran's terrestrial infrastructure all the way to the north, <coughs> crosses the border into Azerbaijan, gets carried into Russia, crosses the border to Ukraine at Rostov-on-Don, and then cable and wireless takes it to Frankfurt. That sounds like a crazy route, but actually, if you look, it's a great circle route and uh, could be very low latency. Uh, and again, it goes through different regions. What you're looking for here, if you're, if you're if I'm a company in the Gulf and I want reliable connectivity, I want to buy from consortiums or, or from companies that can offer me diversity. And these paths give me diversity. Um, We'll talk in a minute just briefly about Iraq, which also is, is emerging from, from war and talking about becoming an internet provider. Um, Iraq is very central, right? If you look at the geography of Iraq, you couldn't pick a better place to build a regional backbone. Uh, in the south, they have submarine cable landings for major cables at Basra. If you look west, they have uh, overland through the desert to Jordan and Saudi Arabia and Syria. If you go east, you can hit Iran. If you go north, you can hit Turkey. It's, it, if there were a government there that wanted to make this a priority, uh, you know, the geography is actually pretty sweet. At the moment, they have, as you'd expect, sort of fundamental problems with keeping uh, electrical power grid uh, operations and so forth. But uh, you know, over time, these things will work out. If you look at Iran, of course, we always, uh, since 2009, we've had our eye on Iran uh, and their control of the internet. Where does Iran's internet actually come from? We, you, know, you never think about you know, where does internet come from. Uh, some of it does come from the Gulf over the submarine cables that everybody else uses. But a lot of it these days actually comes from the north. It comes from Russia. Uh, Russia through uh, uh, Azerbaijan, through the Baku Internet Exchange, is exporting internet transit to Iran, uh, which gives them, again, I wrote a blog about this, they have to balance they have to maximize the diversity. They don't want to get cut off by a cable cut in the Gulf. They want to have a backup route through a friendly party to the north. So it's just common sense. Um, Iran has written, I guess as recently as May, about the possibility of going it alone. Uh, they'd, you know, they'd like to disconnect from the internet and run their own internet. Um, Iran does have a, a very mature internal domestic internet with a lot of richness and a huge number of autonomous systems. Uh, so I guess we'll, we'll leave that as an exercise to see whether they can ever accomplish that. But it's interesting because they actually use the internet regionally, geopolitically, to get influence over neighbors. So Iran is a net exporter of internet transit because they sell to, uh, to, to Iraqi Kurdistan, for example. Uh, if, you're, if you are in Suleimania, you can buy Iranian internet transit. 
Um, if you're in Herat in Afghanistan, uh, because the big ring of fiber that surrounds Afghanistan has, has been somewhat dysfunctional for a long time, uh, in Herat, one of your only choices for internet service may in fact be going across the border uh, into Iran. And Iran is happy to provide that service. This is one of the, the uh, in addition to energy exports and financial support for that region, this is one of the ways that they can be a good neighbor and, and have influence over what develops there. They maintain communications. My next slide. Perfect. I, I did not I did not schedule that. Uh, so yeah, go north. So now you're. We started where it was easy. Now it's really not easy. Okay. Now we are in a very sticky region politically, uh, uh, in terms of energy distribution, in terms of, of the, the politics of your neighbor to the north. Um, there is a cable system in, in Georgia called the, the Caucasus Cable System, uh, which runs uh, east to west. You can you pick up service in Baku, there on the right. Go across Azerbaijan. You cross the border with the, uh, the, uh, the pipeline that goes past Tbilisi. You head over to the Turkish border, and you're off to Turkey. If you go north to the coast, um, you can reach, I think it's Poti, where there are submarine cables ready to take your traffic across the Black Sea to uh, Romania uh, or to, uh, to Varna in Bulgaria. Big pipes. Um, they are alongside energy pipelines, which are uh, perhaps risky places to run transit uh, in, in, a, in a dangerous place. But uh, that's what provides the east-west transit that people want to use if they don't want to go south to Iran or go north to Russia. So Azeri providers have been carrying a lot of the, the weight here. They are providing uh, everybody who's on the other side of the Caspian Sea. Uh, eventually, there will be pipelines across the Caspian Sea once they kind of get the international ownership of the sea sorted out. And there will be fiber routes. And those fiber routes are going to need backhaul to Europe. And the Caucasus will provide it. Um, you may have read uh, last year about uh, a big internet outage in Armenia where a grandmother cut a cable in Georgia. And this is her. <laughs> <laughs> she has her own Facebook. Book page. Uh, she. Uh, Are you friends with her? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, she, a, a large part of this, the Armenian internet, just went on, went dark, and it was because up here, just north, uh, just it was just west of Tbilisi. She, as the story goes, was foraging for fi firewood and happened to come across a piece of fiber which theoretically was buried six feet deep beside the Georgian National Railway, and she sliced it, and she turned Armenia off, and a lot of Georgia. Um, so she, you know, it's interesting because she actually says she didn't do it. She says she doesn't know what they're talking about. She didn't, wasn't anywhere near there. But steals copper for a living. It says there. <laughs> yeah, she. This is, you know, she, she's the most powerful woman in, in this segment. She, wow. She's not straight that page, oh. I think. <laughs> no, I think somebody did this on her behalf. Um, <laughs> but it, it makes you think. Incidents like this make you think. If these information routes become incredibly important for people who are trying to circumvent, let's say, transit routes through Russia. Accidents happen. Uh, if you cross into the Trans-Caspian region and go to Central Asia, you're way up uh, in, in, the, in the beyond. Um, these are classically places where um, they're getting a lot of their transit still from the Russian providers, but there are also paths opening to China. Um, Uzbekistan was actually one of the people who stepped in when Afghanistan lost their links to Pakistan. The, the Afghan government, for a time, was buying the majority of their transit from Uzbekistan through that little pass there. And it was all going to Russia. Um, Turkmenistan, again, there's huge amounts of energy exploration around the Caspian Sea. Turkmenistan is in the, in the core of this. Uh, they've built new, uh, they are building new pipelines and I think railway links to Iran. Every time you do that, somebody's going to lay fiber because it doesn't cost very much extra to do that. And so new paths will open up and we will see them emerge. Uh, Russia really does have uh, a huge amount of regional influence. Uh, we actually took a measurement here uh, from our routing table studies and said, what percentage of each country's network providers are on net, meaning somewhere upstream there's a Russian provider? Um, so as you'd expect, it's 90% uh, all through uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Russia itself. 
And then there's a tail. Armenia has less. Why? Because Armenia buys a lot of transit from the Turks. Uh, Latvia has less. Why? Because they're facing Europe and they can buy some of their own stuff directly. Uh, Iran, uh, Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, all uh, buying but on the border. So they have other choices. And, uh, and then through the Iranians, of course, Iraq and Afghanistan actually were uh, getting a significant portion of their internet traffic through the Russians. So this is a, this is a very real uh, sphere that they have worked pretty hard to build. It's, it's economically quite important. Lithuania, not on the list. Uh, it may, I'm not sure if that's an accidental omission or if it's just because they, they simply uh, went west. If you, if you can go west, you should. Almost all of the transit that you see represented here is backhauled to just a few European cities like London uh, or Frankfurt. <coughs> so if you can go there yourself over your own territory, you shouldn't bother. So real quick, and then we can go with, uh, with open session questions. Um, as you've seen, there are really obvious ways that energy security ties in with information transport. So um, most people, terrestrial at least, don't set out to build uh, fiber systems where it's expensive and they're breaking new ground. Usually they will follow existing pathways, where, whether that's power lines, uh, pipelines, side highways, uh, unless you have absolutely no choice. Uh, submarine fibers. The, the way that almost everybody on Earth uh, gets their long-haul connectivity is famously safe. Why? Well, it's, you know, geopolitically, it's interesting. It goes through international waters where it's hard to find, let alone break. Uh, but then if somebody does manage to break it, well, it takes, can take up to weeks to get a ship out to the middle of the ocean and fix it. Um, these terrestrial fibers that we've described are crossing national borders, and that automatically gives you risk, political risk, over who's going to control each station along the fiber. Would you buy into a cable that was running through uh, four countries, none of which were really your friends, and uh, in each country it was the incumbent, the least responsive provider that was uh, um, providing service? It still may be worth it because they may give you a good price. Um, it may be the lower latency price. The terrestrial routes out of the Gulf are certainly going to be much faster than the submarine routes that have to go all the way around the Arabian Peninsula to get back to Europe. Everybody's making these trade-offs all the time. To what extent is the political risk a denial of service or a slow roll of service as opposed to the local security folks dipping in? Um, so local security guys dipping in is generally a risk for the local people, right? Uh -huh. So uh, access networks. Um, here we're mostly looking at, uh, I just want to cross your country. I want to get my YouTube videos and I want to stream them through your country as rapidly as possible. Uh, so the really, the, as you say, the risk is denial of service. The thing could break, could simply be turned off. Uh -huh. We could say, you know, I, we're renegotiating the deal. I think we'll just you know, try this again. That has not happened. And I think it's interesting to look at the, the game theory of a multi-nation uh, uh, cable system. Because if you turn it off, everybody loses revenue. Um, you can see here that, that several of these countries are, are hard at work continuing work that they've done in other arenas in the past. So Turkey emerges as a vastly important connector. Uh, Russia continues to be a vastly important connector. Uh, Iran and to some extent Saudi Arabia are both going to be uh, uh, regional hubs and uh, possibly others in that space like the Emirates or Oman. And of course way out in the end, we didn't talk because I mercifully stopped the tour, but uh, China is sitting at the other end uh, and also has significant interests in internet paths. Um, so in all these ways, there's a lot of a lot of economics. Uh, uh, you didn't mention India here. in this context. I did not, and even better, I didn't mention Pakistan. Um, uh, it was skillful of me, I thought. Um, there is, of course, the, the is it the Karakoram Highway that links Pakistan with China? So it's supposed to be four tanks wide. Um, there's a new uh, 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 Chinese base at, uh, at Gwadar on the, on the coast near the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, all of these things will contribute to the building of, uh, of international relations, probably internet connectivity between Pakistan and China over time, um, which would be great because otherwise to get from Pakistan to China takes a long time. You have to go typically all the way around on fiber through the Straits of Malacca and all the way up the coast and back in. Um, so. From the standpoint of, you know, the internet should get better, the internet should get cheaper, the infrastructure should get more reliable, all the links should get shorter. That's, that's great. The, 
Uh, more connectivity is seldom a bad thing. Still didn't talk about India. <laughs> um, India is well served by submarine cables, uh, very richly so. They've been one of the original stops on both coasts on many major cables. And so India doesn't have to worry a great deal about its international connectivity. They don't have a lot of people that they seriously need to talk to to their north, uh, although shorter routes to China would be better. Um, India has, a, as you know, a, a great uh, IT industry and, and actually one of the, uh, the largest um, tier one providers in the world, Tata, is an Indian company uh, projecting internet transit east and west from, from, this, from, from India. Um, so it's interesting. India is in some sense well connected. They are more like uh, uh, in pricing and, and in connectivity, they are more like a, a, a European or a, or a North American scenario. In these other places I've described, it's sometimes hard to, as to understand how big the gap is. It can be a uh, hundred times difference in the price. You can pay one euro to transit one megabit of service for a month if you're in Frankfurt. And it can cost a hundred or hundreds of euros if you are in the Gulf or if you're in Sub-Saharan Africa. You have these massive differences in price. And there are companies that have vested interests in, in making money from that spread. So every time you get more connectivity, that spread will drop. And the living standards for people in, in the internet in hard to reach places will go up. But it will also kill a lot of companies, uh, inevitably. So everything is about politics and money. How much does that spread is determined just by geography and how much of that is kind of political and, and economic manipulation of, of the price? Is that with, easy to say? Or? With the exception of certain really expensive cables to lay that have to be paid back and therefore they're always going to be expensive to be on. It's almost never the cables. It's almost never the distance. It is almost always local politics and local competition. In particular, it has to do with who owns the landing station for the cable. Um, in some countries, the incumbent is the natural person to own the landing station. And um, if the incumbent owns the landing station, it means that no competitive provider necessarily can get access directly to the international carriers. They might like to go to the landing station and say, I want to buy uh, you know, a gig of, of transit from Level 3 or from Singapore Telecom or, or Deutsche Telekom. Um, but they can't get it. They say, no, I'm sorry, you've got to go through us. We're reselling. We have the license on the landing station for 20 years, and we're going to resell that transit to you at the market price, which was approved by the regulator. And that's the story. There are other places like Bahrain where they've made a very concerted effort to have more landing stations on more diverse cables and to put them all in different people's hands so that you actually do get some choice. It's always in private hands. Almost always yes, because you have, well, you have to have somebody to operate the landing station, which is a, a technical operation. Um, and typically those franchises are granted for a period of years, and they can include exclusivity. And under those circumstances, prices don't tend to drop. Um, there's, there are examples in the world where, for example, flag lands twice in Aqaba. And so Jordan Telecom has one landing station. And one of the competitors, I think it's VTEL, operates the other one. And yet, uh, when we look at it, um, we never see uh, measurements go through the second landing station. Whenever we try to go to Jordanian targets uh, to reach them with a trace or something or a ping, uh, the traces always go through the, the primary. And we, we don't see VTEL on the path. So why is that? We don't know. It's, there are mysteries like this that remain. Um, where I was going with that question was, um, I want to get a sense from you of the degree to which the governments, as well as the businesses, but especially the governments, right. recognize the internet as a rising tide that lifts all economic boats, right? Right, and and work not to protect the incumbents, whatever they may be, and their parochial interests in a really rather narrow business. Right. that they operate at the expense of the rest of the economy. I think it's hard to talk about governments all through this region as having monolithic intent or strategy. Mm. In many cases, there are internal uh, divisions 
where uh, one group may be interested in promoting security, which is much easier if you have a single strong incumbent. Another group might be interested in promoting competition and reducing <coughs> prices for consumers, which happens better if you have a distribution of control. And so they have different strategic interests, and often in, in some of these countries, you'll see that play out as a matter of domestic politics. How is that balance going to tip? <coughs> in the abstract, I think everybody recognizes the value of information and the internet now. Uh, concretely, uh, you know, often the the uh, the major internet providers in a country are some of the largest companies in the country, and so getting them to change direction or strategy uh, is is a maybe a frightening proposal. Yeah, sure. a few years ago, we know that Russia uh, cut the natural gas pipelines towards uh, Ukraine. Yeah. I think it's not possible if uh, uh, Russia has quarrels with the companies that depending on infrastructure or internet. Right. Is Russia possible to cut off those services? Yes. And any fiber that is, you know, in any country is subject to the laws of that country and can be turned off. Um, gas pipelines, you know, there aren't as many of them as there are fibers that carry bits. and so. Uh, they are more vulnerable to disconnection because if I know that you're going to just route around me, I may not bother. Uh, that's why uh, people start to look at this strategically and they say, well, so I'm, I need, uh, you know, I need three fast paths between London and Beijing. And so I need them to be fast and reliable and cheap. That's impossible. So. Maybe I'll take one of the main submarine routes out of the London Internet Exchange, uh, go all the way around uh, through Egypt, through the Suez, through the Straits of Malacca, up around and into Beijing. But then maybe I'll take a second route, and I'll get one that goes uh, through Russian territory. It goes along the old the Siberian Railway and, and heads right out. And that'll be lower latency, but it'll be slightly higher price. That's the trade-off. Then they may say, well, you know, Anything could happen to those two. I need a third one. And so the third one today might be, I'll follow the Roman roads to Istanbul. I'll ride across Turkey on either Turk Telecoms or Turk Cell's fiber backbone. I'll hand off to my partner in Georgia. I'll ride through the Caucasus. I'll reach Baku. Um, who knows what happens from there? You know, maybe, maybe then I'm happy with my Russian path. Maybe in the future something else develops to the south. It's this continuous game, and companies really do play it when they have the information of trying to figure out what risk are they exposed to, um, how do I hedge that risk appropriately? Because uh, it, it used to be the case, in, especially in the Gulf states, that you could have a single fiber would break somewhere off of Egypt, and it would take you out for a week or two weeks, the whole country. And people recognized that that was not really uh, consistent with, with economic development or with an IT industry that functions, or with banks, or with anything these days. Does Japan and Korea have any role to play in this region, or are they just little self-contained uh, places? Uh, J Japan hosts, uh, uh, for example, NTT, uh, so one of the, the big tier ones that can offer you service anywhere in the world. Um, but uh, geographically, uh, Japan and Korea are pretty much at the end end of the line from that side. And like don't nobody, nobody, would, nobody would send traffic east from, uh, from the Middle East to, uh, through Japan. Uh. Um, I've seen, uh, when, when there were outages in the, in the Mediterranean, I've seen uh, Gulf states send traffic over satellite to the Hong Kong teleport. So you, you, but not terrestrially. But not terrestrially. Well, uh, mostly on submarine. I mean, it, and typically, we call those the wrong way around the world routes. Um, so I'd rather get the short route to Europe, and if I can't get it, well, I will go the long way. But you're talking about hundreds of milliseconds. So try doing uh, voice. Try doing high latency or low latency uh, uh, trading, you know, uh, over a link like that, and just it work. So a second question: When you're talking about the Gulf states going offline for a week, doesn't that really mean switching to satellite or some other high-cost provider for the week at a greatly increased cost? For some of them, it does. So some some autonomous systems will retain connectivity on contract for for cases just like that. <coughs> so a bank, for example, might have a satellite link that they could use. Um, somebody like uh, the African Development Bank in Tunisia has satellite connectivity that they maintain 
just in case something goes wrong with, with Tunisia's actual connectivity. Um, but most people these days look at the internet, and, and, and by people I mean corporations, uh, will look at the internet and say, wow, I can get a cost savings here of orders of magnitude over, you know, before I had to buy a, a, a wavelength or a fiber path or something going uh, on, under the ocean. Uh, now I can just buy generic internet from my local provider, and it will be 100 times cheaper. So people look at that, and they don't go back. And in satellite internet is, is even more expensive than any of the alter other alternatives on Earth, um, historically. So they, often they, they tear those down, and they uh, get rid of the Earth station, and they forget about it. They don't want to look back. So I, I'm curious about the, the uh, connection between the content layer and the transport layer. Right. So one of the things I, I wondered when you showed that great map of influence of um, of Russian sourcing of the internet right. is to think about. So, uh, so um, I, we have some data that shows that Russia, Russia and China in particular, are mostly internets in any case. They overwhelmingly look at um, content hosted within their own network. Right. And so, I would be curious to know if there's any relationship between um, between exporting of content to exporting of traffic for uh, Russia and China in other countries. Right. So. Um, there is a coupling between content and traffic, clearly. Uh, in the case, um, China and Russia are interesting because they are both their own uh, center of gravity for their own language. And so they tend to have their own content in country. Um, there is a Russian diaspora all through this, the, the former Soviet Union. And so there is a lot of traffic that comes to Russian content from there. Um, there are other, the other big players, it's kind of interesting actually that the big guys are the ones who have idiosyncratic or, or, or local language populations where the, they host their own content, Turkey uh, and Iran predominantly. Um, but um, it's actually interesting because a lot, of the con a lot of the traffic is driven by things like YouTube videos. Uh, YouTube and Google in general don't host everywhere. They, they can be fairly selective about where they end up. Where they end up has enormous <laughs> impacts on the local internet cost structure. Um, if you get large content to appear in a local data center, suddenly everybody locally will want to be at that data center and interconnect. Uh, this can overcome, for example, some of the problems um, that you have in relationships between incumbents and competitors in a small country. Uh, if, if you have local content problems, uh, regulations that forbid you from hosting certain kinds of YouTube videos, for example, um, you may find that that content will not settle itself inside your jurisdiction. As soon as you've lost the content in your jurisdiction, well, now you're just another guy at the end of a soda straw who has to go get his video content from Europe or from California, and then everybody pays. And so there is a very real coupling between content regulation and infrastructure quality and infrastructure cost and infrastructure delay. Uh, by chasing the big content out of country, you're basically forcing everybody to, uh, to go where the content is to get it. I'm specifically curious about China as well, because China seems um, politically, they're clearly very focused on doing essentially what you said Iran is trying to do, which is just building an internet. Right. They don't really care about outside content. They just want all, they've tried very hard to make all, virtually all the content to be local. But at the same time, you paint a picture here where there's sort of power and influence and money to be gained by exporting um, the traffic itself, the sort of right. connectivity. So there seems like there's a tension there between there is building connections for to export them, but keeping the content local. Yep. Um, Iran is the same thing on a small scale. You know, Iran wants to be an island, but they also export the internet. A lot of it here is, is geography. So Iran exports because they can. They have easily accessible neighbors. Russia has its diaspora population, and they have contiguous territory, so they can. There's also railroads, pipelines, roads in place to allow them to, to connect easily. And so they do. And uh, they do good business uh, doing internet service to their neighbors. China is less so. China really is more, more of an island, and even in a place that you would expect, like, for example, Vietnam, where you might think 
there would be significant internet traffic between the two. Um, you do see that China Telecom, for example, provides internet service to some of the providers in Vietnam. But when you actually go and find out what do the Vietnamese providers choose when they want to go to the internet, meaning we study all of the, tr all of the active measurements, we study all of the routes, we try to figure out how much Vietnam really goes to China to get traffic, to get content, it's very small. Uh, the Vietnamese providers apparently really just want to get onto the big tier one global carrier's backbones and get out and get YouTube videos. You know, they don't, it's not clear that there's a lot of Chinese content that is, that is really on their radar. So China is much more self-contained. There's a lot less, let's call it export, to neighbors. Kind of, kind of. Going. No, that's very interesting because it, it shows that there's like a, there's a major economic and political influence cost in China's decision to kick YouTube out, right? And that's the, yes. I mean, they 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 have this very powerful internal network they've controlled that they control very well that provides the sort of key cast that, that folks want, but the cost is they can't export YouTube, which is that's true. China's mining for it, and they don't they don't have the political influence they can. Right. Anybody who doesn't host big content on your own network in your own country, you're a consumer. <laughs> you, you end up having to go out and get the content. And you know that traffic flows are really asymmetric. I make a tiny little request for a video, and then I get megabytes of video. I get a gigabyte of video streaming in at me. So uh, uh, those are scenarios where you lose, you lose power if you don't have uh, a, a balance of traffic. If you're always the guy who has to receive the content, and you have nothing locally to make that easier on you, uh, it, it really constrains growth. And I think we've touched on a few of the ways that it affects the ways that incumbents choose to compete with uh, or not with but their competitors. Don't some countries, Iran, for example, and in the news lately, China, mm -hmm. uh, may be trying to actually do that intentionally because they don't want their internal population to be exposed to all this? Yes. That's the question. Um, that has been stated by Iran, at least back in May, as an explicit intention. We just, we'd like not to go get that content. And you kind of have to ask, will the, will the, will the Iranian population sit still and just be happy with, with Iranian tube and with Iranian search engine and with Iranian Facebook? I don't know. Uh, the companies that work there certainly need unfiltered access to the real internet, not because they want to go get YouTube, but because they actually want to connect to people and, and and sustain commerce and get financial data and so forth. So can you have it both ways? Can you grow an internet economy where the businesses are happy but also build a restrictive consumer internet where nobody looks at all the good stuff? I don't know if that's socially sort of sustainable in the long run. Do, do any of the, of the operators, the carriers, say, based on what you just said, geez, we'd really like to get Google here. <laughs> Um, and offer them, hey, look, we've got conditioned power, we've got real estate, we can give you space. Or if that stuff happens, is it so below the table that nobody knows about it? Um, so I'm not, I'm not authoritative on this question because I'm not Google. Um, I think that, that, I don't think Google guys ever have to buy beer. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, people make, make are very friendly and want to demonstrate the benefits of a place, um, but ultimately I suspect that it scrapes up against not only power and stability and so forth, but, you know, friendly regulatory environment. And I don't know, that would be, uh, if, if you have that as a uh, Berkman Center luncheon, I will come to that one, if you <laughs> hear Google comment on this. <laughs> They'll come here, they just won't say anything. <laughs> but the guy we know drinks wine. <laughs> They'll be happy to come here and let us buy them beer. <laughs> no wine. The, um, cool. Just a procedural question. At the beginning, sure. you, you, just, you said that you get data from lots of ISPs. Mm -hmm. um, what do they get in return? Like, why would an ISP give you the information? Right. Um, this question, the answer to this question has evolved over 10 years. In the very early days, um, I participate in a lot of the network operator groups, the guys that actually, I don't do this, but these guys do this. So I, I'm, I've done program committee work, for example, with NANOG in North America, uh, with MENOG, the Middle Eastern Network Operators Group, uh, with ENOG, the Eurasian Network Operators Group. Uh, in the early days, it was very much about, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, can we help you measure? And it, we could talk to route, routing engineers and they would simply turn on sessions to us. Uh, we would give them, we still do give them uh, some feedback in the form of uh, complimentary subscriptions to some of the tools so that they can look at the engineering tools and see, you know, why are my routes withdrawn or uh, uh, to try to figure out some of the paths that, uh, that their traffic might be taking. So there is some concrete benefit there that they get. Um, as the set has grown, um, we, used to, we used to go out and try to meet specific providers and really, you know, please connect to us because we need your perspective. Now we're up to, um, I think it's about 400 different unique sessions. And we now have coverage in almost every country and with almost every provider that is sort of substantially in the way of large amounts of traffic. And at that point, we've reached, uh, I won't call it com a complete picture, but something which, which, which reliably fails to disappoint when we try to ask it questions about regional connectivity. Um, so that the, the stress is no longer there to go and get more and more uh, connections for this, this uh, observation system. Um, but the, everybody who does join up does get a, uh, some complimentary subscription to the, the data services, which they find useful. Mm -hmm. How big a market is there of the engineering firms that actually do the work of laying the MBIS-C cable? Are there a few large providers, or is it a fairly open market? You know, I'm, I'm not totally read in on that. There, a, a project like that, um, they don't happen at the rate of hundreds per year. You know, they, they have they happen they tend to happen in, in peaks and valleys. Uh, <laughs> there'll be a big burst of cable laying, and then there'll be a, a, a desert for a few years where everybody says, "Wow, we really built too much cable." Um, uh, I, I don't know what engineering firms, I know Alcatel Lucent has done a lot of work like that, they, especially in, in the Gulf region, they lay a lot of cable. Um, they tend not to be the companies themselves, you know, laying the cable, that, that operate the cable. There's sort of a separation of concerns, but there can't be too many layers because frankly there's not a lot of money left in pushing bits around the planet. So everybody's pretty tight. What uh, sort of a order of magnitude? cost would there be to lay sort of an undersea uh, cable landing? I don't want to, I don't want to misquote, and, and my knowledge may be, may be way out of date. Uh, so let, let me get back to you. So I'm very curious about, you said earlier about the, that <coughs> Egypt was able to shut down its internet because Egypt Telecom Controlled the physical infrastructure. My, with with absolutely no grounding, my story I've I've told with that is that it's just a matter of a dozen telephone calls to companies that Egypt has some influence over. So, but that's actually a very different story, which is very interesting. So, I'm curious if you have what sort of evidence, what you know about that. Um, um, what that's yeah. Like. So I don't have definitive evidence on either side of that. The 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 majority of the reports that we had received said it was one of those two scenarios. Either it was 12 phone calls uh, or it was uh, a physical shutdown. And what we did, <coughs> I wish I had the slides, was we, in the blog you can see it, we looked at the time series of outages to see how fast it happened. And then we asked ourselves, I think every route went out within 20 minutes, except for the providers that were unaffected. And we said, well, is that a time scale that makes sense with phone calls or physical infrastructure? And initially, I said, that has to be phone calls. 20 minutes? I mean, that's you know, an, an eternity on the internet. And somebody pointed out to me that um, if you have uh, UPS gear, uh, so battery backups for your routers, and they're in a rack, and they're in some dark, dusty room in the basement of an exchange building, and somebody turns off the power, what will happen? Well, <laughs> They'll, some of them will, will immediately die because they've never been serviced. And, you know, like my battery backup at home probably would not work right now if the power went out. Others of them will, will have been refreshed. And maybe you get three minutes. Maybe another one you get eight minutes. And after about 20 minutes, they're dead. Uh, so all we have is, I think, anecdote and inspection of the outage data. Uh, but I'm reasonably convinced at this point that it was, in fact, power related, probably at a central point. Anybody have better evidence? I'm here scouting for evidence as well. 
is an unusual thing. I mean, the level of, we look at a lot of these countries, we come up with scores for them based on how many different people actually have international access. That's usually a fairly good metric of what's going to happen under duress. If you have a large number of domestic providers, all of whom are able to buy directly from European or Asian providers, that's usually a sign that everybody has access to the cable landings, um, that everybody can write the contracts that they need to. Uh, it typically means that there's nobody sort of uh, uh, being the bottleneck. And so based on that alone, I had predicted better survivability for Egypt during the Troubles because there are several independent providers there, all of whom at a logical level in the routing, in the paths, look like they have perfectly good direct relationships with international providers. But we underestimated the degree, I think, to which Telecom Egypt still owned the exchange infrastructure, uh, controlled the power, uh, owned the ducts, owned the fiber, all the things that you had to have in order to make the connections to the international providers. So it was, it was hidden lack of diversity. So I guess my, sorry for dominating. No. So my, my other question I have is about um, edge peering, mm -hmm. which is this problem that if you're, if you're monitoring um, routes by just looking at routes and right at route announcements in the core of the network, basically. Right. And there's no way for you to see the little peers who are just the, the networks on the edge who are just announcing peer connections in between one another. Do That's you, right. Do you feel like you have a grasp of what those connections are, or you feel like they just don't matter, or it just don't matter for your purposes? Um, that is one of the systematic errors in this approach. Uh, any approach that's based on observing paths, routing paths. Uh, you're right. So if you imagine the internet as sort of a, a big mountain, snow-capped mountain like Ararat. Um, so the, the absolute edge, those of us with DSL at home, we're at the base of the mountain looking up at the summit. And you buy from a provider who's at base camp one. And maybe he buys from a provider who's at base camp two. And on up to the top, at the top of the mountain there are about 12 or 13 providers holding hands with nobody above them. The, default free zone, the tier one of the internet if it exists. And all they do is pass traffic to each other, basically settlement free. So that's how it always worked before. And what has happened over time is a greater and greater tendency for people halfway down the mountain to string fiber to each other from base camp to base camp and deliberately so that they don't have to, to pay to carry traffic all the way to the top of the mountain and back down again. Um, when will Renesis see that? Well, we see it whenever we have a relationship for collection with one of the providers who is below uh, the provider of, in, of interest, right? So if I, have, if, I'm, if I have sessions from two or three people down at base camp one, and I want to find out who uh, base camp, a guy way up at base camp four is peering with, uh, I'm in good shape because they are his customers, and I hear from them what he is doing. I will see the peer routes to his peers. Uh, edge peering is the hardest case, where people way down low, who historically never should have had enough traffic to make it worth it, are peering. It makes it very hard for Renesis to get a collection uh, a relationship with either of the parties. And in that case, we will not see that peering edge. It's a, it's a, a known problem. Um, if, that, if these are small guys who are just peering for fun, because, you know, uh, I'm the University of Iowa and you're the biggest computer repair company in Iowa and we should be peering, it may not matter. If the people at the edge are content providers, maybe emerging large content providers, then yeah, we're missing some of the traffic that's implied by those routes. But that's what active measurement is for as well. So in the last couple of years, as I said, we've done a lot of work to get dozens and dozens of vantage points from which we can do active trace route to every prefix in the global table, the entire world basically so that we can try to find some of these paths in traces even when we don't see them in the routing. And we can sort of put those two views of the planet side by side, the physical router connectivity side and the logical route side, and say, oh, this is interesting. There's, a, there's an edge being crossed here in this graph that is not actually crossed in this graph. And it causes consternation, gnashing of teeth, and then we figure out what it is. Are there research projects here that are uh, thinking along similar lines? Uh, 
this is a research project that would like to have the answers to this question. <laughs> <laughs> well. So, so you've made a, a, a compelling case about the geopolitical power, the, the potential for power. But how, how often do you see manifestations of this? I mean, you've also talked about the, you know, the accident, the grandmother with the, and the anchor. So accidents right. are not that, and the self-inflicted damage is not that. Right. But how often do you see people threatening to shut down or actually shutting down access? Has that happened? I have never seen it attributed. And you would think that, yes, if you were going to use something like that to, as a lever of power, you should talk about it. You know, yeah. here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I just did. And it, we haven't haven't seen a lot of that. There was we we were. Uh, I remember during the the brief Russian Georgian skirmish that went on, we were actually watching um, Georgian routes through Turkey, and because uh, we were curious what would happen, there was some speculation at the time that somebody would launch uh, attacks and maybe take out the pipeline in order to create some some economic chaos. Well, it never happened. I think there were some near near misses, but uh, no specific attacks. But there would have been an impact on global routing at that point. It would have been accidental, though, as a byproduct of somebody who's trying to to exert influence through uh, you know, blowing things up. The, the internet would not have been the target. Uh, as I say, the internet is harder to use as a weapon, I would say, at an infrastructure level, just because there is so much internet. And the credible threat of turning something off goes away if everybody has two or three backups. You could use this against French Polynesia to great effect. They only have, mm -hmm. you know, a cable. Snap that cable. Now you're under our control. Weren't there real incidents? There was something in Estonia a while ago. Uh, there was the thing during the Georgian-Russian War Every once in a while, during unrest in some of these other countries, a lot of things get turned off, sometimes with prior announcement. There, there was an incident, and no, who knows if this is connected or not. There was an incident back during the Georgian uh, uh, time uh, where the Russian army blew up the cable landing station at Pati, which was, I think, not yet complete, and the fiber was not yet lit. But it was going to be a vast expansion of the uh, Caucasus cable system. It was going to carry large amounts of traffic to Varna across the Black Sea. And the landing station got taken out. Fog of war. Who knows why. Uh, I think a lot of the other incidents that we kind of, we all hear about in the blogosphere are, are you know, DDoSs and things that are at higher levels. I haven't really heard a lot about infrastructure. Maybe because Fewer people comparatively understand the infrastructure. You know, it's kind of magic. It's down under the streets, as we say, and uh, it's not understandable as a target. I mean, if you take out a government website, it means more than if you turn off an internet connection in terms of, you know, in the press, in terms of influence. Which is, I guess, good, right? We don't want the internet infrastructure being used as a geopolitical weapon. We want it being used to to grow economies and foster communication and connectivity, all the good stuff. We don't want it being uh, used as a lever for exercising power. How much does the, uh, I've heard speculation that the, the routing redirects through China recently mm -hmm. were actually signaling of a willingness to use routing as a, a tool. Do you want to comment on that uh, speculation? Read my blog. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I heard that speculation too. So speculations are cool, but they're not, you know, they're not falsifiable. Um, the 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 technical details of that, as and we looked at that in in a lot of detail. It it looked like the kind of thing that was really more more compatible with an explanation by accident than a deliberate signaling of the ability to redirect. Um, but, you know, speculations are, as I say, they're unfalsifiable. So I think that's, uh, I think that's good. Uh, thank you for the talk. Well, and, uh, thank you for inviting me.